Welcome to the only place where real, raw, and vulnerable conversations happen with IFBB Bikini Pros to give you an inside look at their struggles, strategies, mindset, passions, and all of life beyond the stage. This podcast is made to inspire, motivate, and remind competitors and the average gym goer that even the most extreme lifestyles and elite athletes have their ups and downs. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I'm your host, Celeste Rains turk and now it's time for the Confessions of a Bikini Pro podcast. Today's guest is a mom of three who owns three big iron gyms and a coffee stand, all of which she opened up not not that long ago, right? It was It's been almost a decade. Um, well, the coffee stand opened six years ago. So that was like my first little business. And then the gyms, we opened the first one in 2021. And then the second one in 2021. And then the third one just opened in 2024. So that's awesome. The ground run in with that. Yeah, you did. So you've also recovered from a heroin addiction. And this athlete's been clean for the last 11 years, which is amazing. And after competing in four regional shows, she went on to compete in USA's where she won second place and her pro card. She works at Big Iron Babes coaching for competition prep and posing. Welcome to the show, Laura Poster. How are you doing? I'm great. I'm great. I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for um, reaching out. This is Chapo, everyone. Yes, okay. Chapo <laughs> is on with us. So if you guys are watching on YouTube, you'll see her dog. So cute. <laughs> so before you we get snoring. Yeah, you will hear him snoring, but just know it's not either of us falling asleep on each other. <laughs> so yeah, before we jump in, I got to ask you if there's anything you do or think about or maybe a ritual you have before your heel hits the stage. Um, so honestly, I just tell myself I'm a bad bitch. Yeah. <laughs> I just like, I just hype myself up a little bit and I'm like, I just, you know, like I just told myself I worked really hard for this. I think, um, yeah, I just kind of get in that. I turn on that mode and I do it every time I practice posing too. So it's not really like when I practice posing, I'll like, I'll, you'll see me smile and you'll see me like kind of go change my demeanor because I think that's helped me with nerves on stage oh interesting uh when you say change your demeanor you mean like getting into like that that presentation mode yeah it's like almost like an alter ego I guess kind of yeah for sure that's amazing (laughs) so you tell yourself you're a bad bitch and obviously I think we all, when we start competing or when we go into it, no matter how long you do it, I feel like you still get the nerves yeah. and like you get that adrenaline rush. So to be able to like talk yourself through that, but also to practice, practice with that same mentality, that's a really great way to anchor for the stage and bring that same energy to it. So obviously this is something that you've helped a lot of women with as well. Um, what are some of the things, maybe other hacks that you include when you're going over posing with these women you work with in terms of nerves or just like posing Any in general? posing tips. Yeah. Um, I think that the biggest thing that I tried to promote is that like simple and confident presents a lot better than like dramatic and like not very confident, you know, like you can tell um, if someone comes up and they haven't been practicing. Right. But you can also tell if someone comes up and they're just nervous, but they have been practicing. So there's like, um, and I think that I, with all my girls, I just try to get the basics down, you know, like let's perfect this front pose. Let's perfect this transition. Let's perfect this back pose. And then we can add all this stuff later. So confidence, I think is the number one thing that I like to work on. Cause it's like the most, I think it's the most obvious thing when, when women are on stage for me, at least. I would agree with that. I I noticed that the more local shows I go to, the more I recognize this as well. I was at a show recently and I found that when someone doesn't feel confident, one, you can see it, but you can also experience it with them. Like you pick up on it. And I know that the judges must pick up on it too. If we're all out there like, come on, you got this, you know? (laughs) Yeah. I just posed with my coach for the first time in person. Um, I flew down to Vegas to see Adam um, Bonilla and 
the I po we had like a little posing thing and oh my gosh like it was so bad I was so nervous I like could not walk I was like tripping over myself and I was like I swear I'm way better but then I posed the next day and it was like much much better but like yeah the nerves can really mess with you on there so definitely it's just practicing I think you have to practice being confident I guess that's mm -hmm. kind of what I'm getting at you know like and um I just like watching women like really settle into that into that person on stage that's like the most fun part of coaching for me oh I love that's such a cool perspective like to see them embody that especially yeah. when you've shared let some some a part of your mission and I'm sure there's more to this but at least from your post that you want to inspire other women to have it all do it all be it all what does that mean to you and how does that affect how you coach um, I think that mm -hmm. just in life in general, like I had a realization maybe a few years ago where I just was like, oh, if I want to do something, I just have to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, if I want to be a certain way, I just have to be it. And um, yeah, I, I really like carry that on with like my bikini clients, like a lot of them, oh, like my little niche is like moms, right? Like, so I work with a lot of moms and uh yeah, like it's always like that. I just had one today. It's always like, hey, I've kind of been watching all the all the teenies, you know, like I'm kind of interested in competing. And it's like, okay, you're a competitor. Let's yeah. do it. You know, like you're it. And there's always that when people start, they're like, if they haven't got on stage yet, it's kind of like, oh, am I am I for real? You know, like you feel that, you know, that weird, like, am I actually a competitor? But it's like, no, just dive into it and be a competitor. And I feel that way for like a lot of things, right? Like, do I want to be a better mom? What are, what do I consider a better mom? Okay, I'm going to do that. You know, do I want to be a better partner? Do I want to be a better sister? You know, like, do I want to be someone that's really good at something? I mean, like, I think that's like kind of my like life motto, you know, it's like, just do it. Just, I, Nike really nailed yeah. it with that one. I was like, <laughs> I was thinking that the other day. I was like, damn, I wish I thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> would you have done the swoosh or would you have done it different? Know. It would probably be something way more girly. <laughs> I love Hearts and flowers. <laughs> flowers, yeah, that's even better. Yeah, little stars. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I like that a lot for multiple reasons, but one being like you have to embody it. And anytime I work with people who haven't competed yet and they they're going back and forth in their head on like, I don't feel like a competitor yet. It's like, well, do you live the lifestyle and do you intend to step on stage? Is what is the one thing that keeps you from being one? They're like, well, I don't look like one. Oh yeah. Exactly. You know, it's like most of us don't always look like what you see on yeah. stage. So then none of us are competitors unless it's just that day. So I think it's great that when someone comes to you and tells you they want to compete, you're like, cool, then you're doing it. Yeah. Yeah, because especially it's a lot of like, that's like my niche, I said, is a lot of moms who have put their children first for like the past four, five, six years, you know, some of them are have older kids. And, um, and that was kind of like my like, falling in love with competing, right, is like, I was a stay, stay at home mom for a bit. But then I was like, No, I can't do this. So then we did the coffee stand. But then when we opened the gyms, I saw all these women just like looks so good and like I thought it was like so badass and then I just was like well I'm gonna do it I guess I'm gonna do it now you know you wow. gotta dive in how did you even discover it um well when we open the gyms it's a very bodybuilding um heavy scene right like it's it's a bodybuilding gym like big iron gym is kind of a that's the niche so we I was just around it a lot on Instagram, you know, I would follow like girls and be like, oh, so they're doing it too. So. That's so interesting too, that you opened the gyms before you got into it really. Yeah. Well, my ex was um, a competitor, so he was competing at the time. And then you so. were like exposed to it. You obviously were seeing it all the time. You fell in love with it and now you're coaching it as well. Yeah. 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 I think I've always the coaching makes a lot of sense to me and just the way that I am. Like I've always gravitated towards mentorship roles. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to be some sort of teacher, so like a counselor, you know, like 
that's just where I've always ended up in my career path. So like when I real, when we had a huge change in the company, like last year, um, and I was like, Oh, I should, this is it. You know, like I gotta put my, I gotta be a coach. Right. I, I like educated myself. I already had some like certifications some coaching certifications, but you know, like that was it. Wow. Yeah. You went all in with it. Yeah, that's kind of how how I roll. Yeah. (laughs) So I want to talk more about the businesses because you started with a coffee stand. Yes. How? How Mm -hmm. did you even know that this was something worth doing? And then what? Were you a big coffee drinker? Like walk me through starting a coffee stand. Okay. So I have always worked in coffee and I had managed like quite a few businesses like coffee stands and cafes. Um, Sorry. My mirror just got, got delivered. So, um, uh, I had, I've always managed like little cafes, coffee stands, you know, in my twenties. And then, um, I had my son and then at 23 and then I was a stay at home mom for a little bit. I couldn't do it. And then, um, I don't, I don't even remember. I think I, it started off as, I, I'm still going to do this, I'm putting it out there, but I always wanted to do like a little coffee cart and like go to weddings or like go to events and be yeah. like the girl that's like making coffee in the, in the cute little cart, you know? So that's like still one of my, my goals, but that just kind of like snowballed into a brick and mortar coffee drive. Are there coffee stands where you're from? Honestly, never really saw them other than at the beach sometimes. <laughs> Yeah. So like, it's kind of cool in Washington. They're huge. It's like a drive up little hut and you just drive up and get your coffee and drive off. So it's a good starter business for people that are like wanting to get into business owning. Yeah. I just had a girl staying with me from that area and she's like, you guys have drive through coffee here. And I was like, we actually do. She's like, yeah, but it's not, it's not on every corner, you know, and like yeah, there, there's like a lot everywhere. There's a lot. There's a lot of coffee stands. Um, yeah, I love coffee. <laughs> I drink a lot of coffee too. Did you have this idea because you saw it often and you liked it? Or was it like you always wanted to run a business as well? And it just seemed like a path because a lot of people were doing it? No. So at the time, um, I was, it was just another source of income and like another thing for me to do pretty much. Wow. Yeah. Did that yeah, help I mean- I'm trying to think of the time I'm not confused. Did it help what? Did it help you as a mom? Because you said that you were really like, you were being a stay-at-home mom and you were entrenched in that. So how did that help you? Yeah, so that helped. I think that was like the the biggest like step into myself during, in motherhood. That was like the biggest, that was the start of it, you know, was um, I had, I was a stay-at-home mom and then I didn't go straight to the coffee stand. I just, went and applied at this homeless shelter for I was a doula at the time so I was a birth doula and then so I I just was like I can't do it anymore like I cannot I can't do it so I applied and I had an interview I got a job and I just told my ex like when I got home I was like hey I got this interview I'm going I'm gonna go get a job I can't do this anymore I can't just stay and then so I did that for a while um and then I guess that was actually my very first business my little sole proprietorship um Rooted Earth Doula Care. I was a. Oh, I, was I love a, that name. Yeah, I was a certified um, postpartum doula. I, I shifted more towards postpartum doula work, and I did that for five years before we did the coffee stand. What is postpartum? What does postpartum doula work look like as opposed to like pre- preparing for the actual birth? Yeah, so postpartum doula work focuses more on once the parents have their baby and they're welcoming that child into like their family unit at home so I was also like a lactation certified lactation educator so I helped moms with breastfeeding um you know you just help parents adjust it's a huge huge transition to go from like just two of you to like this living little thing and I think a lot of a lot of people are kind of just thrown into the world and so you're just there for support I really think that's awesome. Did you feel like you didn't have much support after you had your first child? Um, yeah, I would say, yeah, honestly, it was kind of hard. I had, I had, um, so I didn't realize that I had like PTSD from like childhood trauma and 
it like manifested like at the end of my pregnancy and then right after my son like I it was a really rough dark dark time and I did have like my sister and my mom but like I was very much like alone like my partner at the time was working like all the time so I was just at home like with this little baby and um kind of like really going really going through it so yeah and then I um that kind of like evolved into like my practice as a doula so then I started to specialize in working with moms who had experienced like sexual trauma and how that plays into childbirth because that was like my that was like my journey you know and I connected a lot with those women and I was able to support um people through that um so that was actually yeah I, I always smile when I talk about doula work because it it was like just a special thing <laughs> That's so special. And it sounds so personal too. Like you really took your own experiences and maybe made purpose out of that pain as they say. Yeah. Yeah. So doula work is just something that I I had to leave because it was just too, um, like too emotionally taxing. Like, so I just couldn't do it really. Um, But, and I don't think I could ever go back, but it's just something that like I hold very, like I'm very proud of like the work that I did as a doula. And um, yeah, so then anyway, so there was that. And then we were still looking for more income. So then we just opened the coffee store. Wow. And then yeah. the gyms and you have three of them. Now, the thing that's so crazy is most people fear a brick and mortar business, especially nowadays. Like it's not usually the route people want to go. Um, but you have four. So yeah. <laughs> what's been the key to keeping those businesses alive as well as expanding and growing? Because this has been a progression. Um, I think it's like a mixture of things, right? Like there's a little bit of like just risk taking and just like going for it. And then there is, I think, one of the biggest things that motivates me is like oh my gosh all these people like rely on me you know like we have like 40 and almost 40 employees at the gym right I have five girls at the coffee stand and like um like it, we just have to keep it running like these are some people's like legit jobs like 40 hour a week jobs and it's like very that's something that really I I don't take lightly you know like and it's like my only source of income <laughs> so yeah. It's also your I job. Going, yeah, also, it's my <laughs> job. But I mean, I don't know. It's like, um, yeah, I don't know. I love what I do. I really do. I think passion goes a long way in anything. If you if you have the passion for it and you have the capacity for it, because you can have passion without capacity. As you know, you discuss with the doula work. It's heavy, heavy yeah. work. Oh yeah, exactly. I like that passion without capacity. Yeah. And That's you're able to fun. really take that and make something of it and continue to grow with it. Now, how often do you personally go into each of these businesses and what's your specific role? Like, are you more management? Are you more just like overseeing things or are you like, yes, yeah. um, I do. So there's kind of a lot of change within the company right now, but I do like the head coaching. So I kind of like manage the coaching department um, we're like a very full service gym, right? So we have standard gym memberships, 24 seven access, personal training, and then coaching. So there's like a few branches of services that we offer. Um, so I kind of oversee all the coaches and the coaching. Um, I do like a lot of managerial works, like behind the scenes work that just keeps the business running. So my title is BOO. Um, because I lead operations pretty much. And then um, what else? I go to the gym like every day. So I'm in one of the gyms usually every day. Right now, I just took over managing our Seattle location. So I'll be down there a lot more. Um, but yeah, I kind of do everything. You can't like, and that's the trick. Like if you're, if anyone listening wants to open a business and like expand it, like you have to be able to do like every single job, you know? So I feel confident I can do every single job, but just don't have enough like arms that'd be <laughs> difficult <laughs> but you know like that's a that's it you got to do everything and that's fun and like it's very mom and pop shop and I really mm -hmm. am proud of that you know and um I want to hold that value you know as it 
even as it expands. So I try to show face. Yeah. I think that's so valuable. Like I remember I worked for a gym and the owner of that franchise was always there. He was yeah. present all the time. And so it felt like it was very like, it was like very much a family. He was heavily invested and involved. And I think that inspired me as an employee to be involved too, because I saw directly who it was impacting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's fun to watch, like, same thing for coffee, right? Like, it's fun to meet people and like, watch their lives from kind of like afar, but like, everyone is kind of going through the journey of life, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, I kind of like having all these like little connections and knowing all these people and watching them grow and change and you know, Aww. graduate college, get pregnant, have babies. Like that's like one of the most fun things about owning all these businesses. That's cool. Uh, I'm going to ask you a random question. Do you have a yeah. favorite type of coffee? Um, I actually just drink an Americano with two Splenda and then a splash of like milk. Just depends on what I have. Cashew milk right now because it, it's like very low calorie for my prep. Yeah. But that's what I drink. That's awesome. So you're like, very simple in your coffee yeah I am yeah I can make like super fancy stuff but it's yeah. just so much sugar that's like yeah it's a lot of sugar I don't drink calories anymore yeah not really worth it in a prep either yeah so it sounds like you're really committed to the businesses that you have and it mm-hmm. delivers so much fulfillment on multiple levels what are you hoping to achieve? Like, do you hope to open more of these businesses? Are you like good with where you're at? What's your, your goal? Um, personally, I am pretty happy with where I'm at. I mean, nothing is out of the picture, right? Like who knows what will happen in like three years, five years. But right now, like, I think my focus is getting um, the business is a little more organized. So just getting things a little more organized because we did expand like so quickly yeah. that um a lot of it is just <laughs> me behind the scenes like running around with my head cut off with a chicken <laughs> but um so yeah like and we, we're, we're moving in the right directions you know like I have site managers at each location that I trust very much and um we have some really good people in our corner so right now I'm just trying to get us to a like more organized um run program mm-hmm. facility I guess yeah Are you a competitor looking to make mental gains and further your personal development? Are you struggling with the post-show blues or feeling the pressure of prep? Maybe you're lost somewhere in the middle and not sure what's next. If you really want to make peace with food, your body, and your goals, then I highly recommend you check out my competitor card deck, which can be found at www.celestial.fit slash cards. This is a free resource for competitors, and the deck includes three different series. One is affirmations and I am statements. Another is the thought-provoking question prompts that you could journal on or just think about. And the last deck includes action steps with specific mentorship that is going to support you in those areas of which I just mentioned. So whether you're looking to feel better in your own skin, develop a healthier relationship with food, feel more motivated, connect deeply with yourself, or really get into your mindset to bring you closer to your goals, then these cards are for you. And I would love to see you utilizing them. Again, you can visit www.celestial.fit slash cards to download yours right away. So you have a very busy schedule as is like being a mom. That's a whole, that's a whole job in itself. So then to add on top of that four businesses and your lifestyle being in prep for your pro debut. And also of course your previous preps, What's a day in your life look like if you can even describe it? And does that yeah. change from prep to improvement season? Oh yeah, I love that question. So um I can tell you exactly how my days go. <laughs> I wake up at <laughs> like 5 30 or 6. I've been like I've noticed I've been waking up earlier. So more to 5 30 these days. But I wake up early, I walk um my older dog Coco, the one I was barking, so she gets like a mile walk um when the kids are sleeping. And then Chapo gets a walk after her. Then I feed the dogs. Then I make my. Then I'll weigh myself. Then I'll make my coffee. Um, and then it's kind of just chilling until our nanny gets here. Sometimes the kids will wake up 
before she gets here sometimes they won't you know but usually I my typical day is wake up dogs breakfast with the kids or not um then I'll do computer work till about noon and then I train after noon um continue kind of working and then come home that's awesome yeah yeah it's a lot and I can and oh go ahead I can no I was just to say I can work from like anywhere so it's kind of easy you know like I don't have to the, the work that I do doesn't like require me to be like in the gym you know so I truly am like always working but yeah which I know that has its yeah. pros and cons like on one hand I don't have to go in somewhere on the other hand I could answer an email at 2 a.m and I know I know I'm trying to get better at it and like it's just a lot and I try to do like I have to identify when it's like too much and I think that's like what I'm learning is like sometimes it's just like a little bit too much and like what can I and but that's something that we've been working on right is like giving responsibility away where I can so we have like a general manager now that I'm like slowly giving like more and more responsibility to because it takes it off my plate and it um is better for the business right because they're a lot more efficient than I am when something comes up yeah that's a great point there's certain like um I think expectations that each role in a business plays and if you don't give someone those objectives to fulfill it might make those lines blurry between who's really managing or handling that too yeah exactly so um you said that you have a nanny come and spend time with your kids while you're working. I was like, wait, how old are your kids? Cause I believe one of them has to be like 10, right? Yeah. So he's nine. My oldest nine. is nine, my son. Um, and then our middle is five and then our youngest is three. So that's so a- awesome. <laughs> I know. I love them. I love being a mom. That's like my favorite. favorite. But I've done, I do a lot of stuff, but that's like my favorite thing to do and to say that I am. So. Wow. Yeah, they're sweet. They're cute. Did you always um, want to be a mom? I did always want to be a mom from when I was like a little girl. I always wanted to have my, I'm one of three. So I have two sisters. I always knew I would have three kids. Um, mm. Yeah. That's so yeah, cool. Fun. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I know that I, I, think I, I, oh no, okay. you go. Oh, I was going to say, I think I cried the first time I like braided my daughter's hair. because I was like, oh my God, I've been thinking about this since I was like, like your age. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. Yeah. And I mean, even with doula work, like, I think that parenting is just like such a transformative opportunity for people, you know, mm-hmm. like, all right, this is it. This little baby is going to be dependent on me and I'm going to shape it the rest of its personality and experiences for like the rest of its life, you know? So I think that it's wow. just such a big role it's such a big task and um yeah yeah I don't know I don't know where I was going with that but I love parenting yeah I can tell do you have any like do you have anything you would tell yourself as a new mom that you wish you would have heard or that now you know from your experiences yeah I would say that you're the best you can do is the best you can do you know and if it's your best and that's where you're at that day like that's okay you know and I think that people focus a lot more on like what their child has like if they have the newest stuff the highest tech stroller you know like there's all this like stuff that society says that you need but like all a a little baby really needs is like to feel safe and warm and loved and cared for and um yeah I I could cry talking about babies Aww. and um but that's like and I think that's why like I loved doula work so much because it's just like injecting like the next generation with like a great start and like I think that's where our society like really falls off um is like not focusing on those first five years you know mm-hmm. of, like, of a kid's life and like yeah yeah why do you think that is happening mm-hmm. Who knows? I think there's a lot of noise, right? And I think there's a lot of money to be made if you focus on other things because there's no money to be made. And hey, you got to really love on your kids, you know? Like you can't monetize that. So 
yeah, like that's the, I think that's what every person needs, right? Is like that deep feeling of like, oh, someone loves me and cares about me, you know? And like you root that in your child as a baby, you know? So true. Yeah. That's so true. Wow. What a beautiful depiction. And hearing you say that too, like what you would go back and tell yourself is the best you can do is all you can do. And that's enough. I think that can apply to anybody at any day. And especially, yeah. you know, in that new situation, I think that that gravity of a role or identity change in someone's life, and that's an identity or a season that is going to be there forever at that point mm-hmm. on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's like a reality hits, but you know, one of my closest, closest friends is going to have a baby soon, really soon. Okay. Yeah. So give me like, <laughs> is there something you would encourage me as her closest friend that I could do to be the most supportive and engaged? So I would support her like the mother, because everyone is going to want to hold the baby you know, everyone's going to be like, Oh, I want to see the baby. I want to come see the baby. But you know, like not a lot of people are going to say like, Oh, have you baby today? What can I do for you? Can I help you tidy up? Can I help you? Um, can I get you some breakfast ready? Can I bring you some food? Like that's a lot of doula work, right? It's like, everyone loves babies. I love, I love the crap out of babies, you know, but like the mother or the parent, I guess, you know, like they are also in need of like that love and support. So I think as a friend, like you're the best thing you could do is just give her your time and your presence and like help her on where you can. That's awesome. I love that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah I'm excited for her. She's like yeah. such an amazing bird. And I just witnessed my sister become a mom too. Like it'll be almost a year. Um, yeah. Next month is a year and it's just been an incredible journey to witness. And I feel like every situation is like unique in many ways. So it's good to hear that from a friend perspective too. And like that, that came very naturally for my sister because I I always care for my sister, you know? Yeah. Um, But yeah, I noticed like, it's very easy to, to have a tendency to want to like take care of the baby. Like even Mm -hmm. a year later, I'm like, Oh, I really want to see my nephew. But like, yeah. I try to make a point to make sure that I see my sister as my sister exactly. too. Yeah, yeah, because it's, you know, like they just went through this crazy like physical experience. You know, like their body is also really tired and worn and needs to rest, and they're probably not sleeping very much. You know, so it's like, um, sleep is like the number one thing you can do to help someone like that just had a baby is try to make sure that they get good sleep that will help like milk production that will help stress that will help a lot of things and prevent a lot of things too so um yeah yeah. sorry i'm probably like really snoring now chop was really in that deep sleep i know i'm like should i move him i don't want to you're good (laughs) i expected this from a frenchie it's totally fine um so has this influenced your own approach to raising your children or any of your life experiences influenced that? Um, what do you mean? Like, how has your life and maybe all these experiences from business to being a doula to um, relationships and friendships and overcoming an addiction and competing, how has this influenced the way that you raise your children, if at all? Oh, I gotcha. I gotcha. Um, well, it, it like has forced me to be like very intentional with my time and mm-hmm. what I'm doing, right? Because I can get pulled away from work very easily. I can pick up my phone right now and have like 20 million things to do, you know? And yeah. like, if I have the kids with me, like I try really hard to, um, to like give them my time and my attention. And I'm not at all saying that I'm like yeah. the perfect, loving, amazing parent, you know, like I'm a, just a normal human that like has their days and if Mm -hmm. you're a mom you can know it's hard you know but um I think it's just been very intentional with with my children and trying to show them like I kind of kind of go back to what I said before like you could be anything you want to be in life and I really really mean that you know and so I try to like help them figure out what they want to do and they're all so young but I just try to be super supportive and 
and like honor them as little human beings, you know? Yeah, that's so awesome. Well, let's go through your addiction recovery because I think this is a unique story and something that I don't know that I know of other bikini pros who have overcome a heroin addiction. So what was your life like before using, during, and after, if you can walk us through that? Um, so yeah, I started using very young. I was 11. I had experienced some trauma. Um, didn't know what to do with it. Felt really gross, you know, just very typical trauma response. So I was, um, you know, just sneaking out, smoking a lot of weed, popping pills, drinking. Um, but the weird thing about me is that I was still the, I was still myself back then. So I was still very high achieving, right? So like no one really knew. Um, Like I was kind of just, I was like always an ASB. I was always a, I was always like president, you know, like in student council, Mm -hmm. volleyball captain, you know, like I did everything. There was times where like, and I'm not like saying that I was like using every single day at 11, but I started using at 11, like sneaking out. Um. In high school, I kind of kept it together pretty well. I still was pretty productive and high achieving, right? But I would like, if I partied, it was always like way too hard. You know, like it was always like, oh, where's fucked up again? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, So I was always kind of like that girl. And then um, in college was when I started. It was stupid. I just like had a crazy breakup and like started doing heroin, you know, Um. I think it was always going to end up there regardless of like the situation I was in. So I don't like blame anyone for it, but um, yeah, I, I just got really, I got introduced to, I I don't even know. I started using um, and I like down what it went downhill pretty fast. So I was at UW at the time, university of Washington. And I was also playing volleyball at a community college with, Cause I had played volleyball like my whole childhood and I was on a team with like all the girls that I'd played with. And I played a whole season of college volleyball on heroin. Like, it's crazy. I was wow. like, I know I was like, it was like that battle of like, I know I'm a good person. I can do this. And then also like, Oh my God, there's like so much trauma. I don't want to feel it or think about it, you know? So, um, did that eventually it got to the point, obviously, where I was like, what am I doing with my life? And I, went to rehab like four times in six months. So, I, and yes, yeah, six months. So I was like really just trying to get clean, trying to get clean. Um, and then one time it just stuck. Right. So I met my, um, yeah. So I was in NA and then I met my, like my husband at the time. And then things just started getting better from there, you know, like then I stayed cleaner for longer. Um, And like, I wouldn't say that, like, I'm not worried at all about like relapse on like heroin. That's like so far. That's not even, it's not something that I think about, you know? Um, But like, I did try like drinking again. And then I just realized like, man, I don't want to, it doesn't do much for me and it doesn't fit into my lifestyle. So now I'm just like clean just by choice, not because like, I'll like destroy my life using again, you know? Yeah, that makes sense. You're sober completely because you want to be, and there's not an urge or a desire. Was the, when you were going to rehab, you said you went four times in six months, correct? I went to detox. So I went, sorry, I went to detox four times in six months and I went to rehab once. The rehab didn't stick. The the last like detox did stick though. Okay. Interesting. So you got to a point where you realized you were addicted and you wanted to overcome this much of the addiction was rooted in wanting to hide away from your trauma. Did you get trauma treatment as well? Yeah. So that was like the, I had, so I had PTSD, right. That was like what I was living with from 11 Uh until I did something about it at 24. Um, So um, yeah, like, and then, so I was clean for five years before I even treated that part of my Wow life you know like because I didn't really realize I had my son and then that's when I started to really like because childbirth can bring out a lot of trauma for women 
or parents, I should say, who have experienced any sort of childhood sexual trauma, right? So um, that's like exactly what happened to me. Like I just, it all came out like right as my kid was being born, um, like very late in pregnancy. And I was like, that was probably like the worst, even like at, from using like the worst mental space that I had, had been in in a while. Yeah. Um, so that kind of forced me to be like, I need to, I, I have to fix this. Like this is like ruining my life. And then I did um, exposure therapy. That was rough. That oh, was, yeah, I bet. That was, that was intense. So I did um, exposure therapy. And then, and I mean, and if anyone has it, listening has experienced any sort of trauma that you're avoiding, like I tell everyone, like it's horrible and it's terrible, but you're not going to, like, it doesn't pop up in my head and ruin my day anymore. Mm. You know, mm-hmm. like I can, it can pop up in the, thought will just float by like any other thought but like um and the trauma you know like the trauma response is that fear of that event or the situation like pushing it away so um so yeah I did address that and um and then I got into my career as a doula wow did you feel like there was a point where the addiction was more of a physical or chemical addiction where you were really you had the urge for it because biologically you needed it at some point or was most of the times when you used it was rooted in avoiding the trauma I think it was a I think it's a mixture of both honestly but like heroin addiction like opiate addiction is like the worst feeling that anyone will ever that you'll ever feel in your whole entire life so I really do relate with um like people experiencing homelessness on the street you know like drug addicts on the street because I I do know like a lot of people don't want to be there but like I can't even describe to you how sick you get like Mm -hmm. sick sick and it's like traumatizing in its own you know um so so yeah it was a mixture of both and then there's like there's like the dopamine hit that you get when you like use after being sick. And it's like, that's like a weird, that's an addictive, right. You know, like that part is like, is really intense, but um, yeah. Did you find anything to be extra helpful in overcoming it or useful? Mm. I think just community, right? Like I really dove into the NA community, Narcotics Anonymous. um, And I was surrounded by like a lot of people that were also trying to overcome addiction, you know? And even with, I mean, with anything, like that's just human nature, prep, bodybuilding, whatever, you know? Like, um, Like having a community and having people surrounding you, like that's like the most supportive thing that you can have is, is not feeling like alone. Totally. In struggle. Yeah, I think that's honestly underrated a lot of the times. Mm-hmm. Like people understand it or they recognize it, but I don't know that the weight of it is usually understood. And who is in that community is so important and how that community can show up for you. And I was going to ask you how others played a role in your recovery and what you might say to someone who knows someone who's going through that and, and wants to support them in overcoming it how or what would you tell them or encourage them to do? Well, it is really heartbreaking because you can't, no one is going to get clean or get help if they don't want help. Right. And so there's a few different paths, right? There's like the hard, tough love. There's like the almost enabling love um, path of support. But I think being kind and firm, that's like a parenting um saying like you have to be kind but you have to be firm like I feel like that is the best way to go like I'm gonna hold this boundary right I love you very much but like this is a boundary that like we're not crossing we're not gonna go there I'm not going there um you're welcome to come step on the other side of the boundary and like a healthy space but like if you're not then we can't go there and I think that a lot of and I think yeah it's I, it's hard people that are like in active addiction it's like such a tricky spot to be in and it's a really like sad spot because like like I said like no one wants to be there right. you know the person that's in it probably wants to be out of it as much as the people who love them do but then they keep 
the same behaviors and the same actions and then people get frustrated and think like oh they don't even want to be clean but it's like i promise you like no one wants to be there you know like it's a horrible feeling just physically and emotionally so mm-hmm. when did you realize you were using in an effort to avoid feeling or facing the trauma was it immediate um i think like that that is brought up in na right so like i think that idea was first brought up in na like oh oh my gosh like this is this happened to me like like i didn't really think like i didn't process it at all and um and then when i started like being around people in the rooms who were talking about their experience i was like oh is that is that it <laughs> is that, oh shit yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um yeah it's funny because you have no idea and i was also just a little baby you know I was like yeah. a kid. i was young so i had no young. clue i didn't tell anyone I didn't tell anyone until i was like 20 so like that was like a heavy yeah. thing that i carried um and luckily like I have my parents and like my family was like very supportive when I was like opened up to them about it so everyone responded in the way that you would want them to respond but um yeah it wasn't until I was 20 that I really like I like put the pieces together and then after I did the like exposure therapy was when it really like all comes to place because like it affects your personality it affects your behaviors your habits you know like and you have to, unt- I had to untangle like all of that in my life. So you almost have to like relearn yourself as someone who's yes. now processed and faced that. Yeah. I mean, I do think it like halts you. I think trauma does that. It like stops you right there. And, and um, it kind of like, like if you could think of it as a picture, it's like, it just like kind of drags you back. Like you can still move forward in life. Right. But you're never going to like really like move forward at like an accelerated pace if you don't like cut the anchor you know Mm, that's a really powerful point and it takes recognizing that there is an anchor exactly because if you go your whole life and you're just dragging it along and that that's what I was doing right I had no idea I had no idea and then um finally I like built up the courage to like knock that off and now it's like oh okay (laughs) So this like, is what life is like. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Wow. It's 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 difficult to face those things, but like going back to your earlier point, you had encouraged others who might have trauma to do the work anyways, as hard as it is, so that they can feel that freedom from it. In that journey to getting help for it, did you find yourself resisting getting help? on facing the trauma or were you like once you knew that that was part of it you're like okay I'm ready to face this head on um I like when I so when I got clean I still didn't work on it right like I just kind of knew and I only started after I had Russell but um no I really wanted to be a doula right and I really wanted to get this certification to work with moms with that had experienced it I felt very drawn to that, but I hadn't done any of the emotional work um, at all. So I couldn't even read the book without just like breaking down. Um, so, uh, yeah. So then that was kind of like the, okay, okay, we got to do it, you know? So I had been kind of avoiding it up until then. Wow. Um, yeah, I had there, I went to a therapist and I just was like, I don't want to talk about that. So I just didn't talk about it yeah. like a different therapist. <laughs> Is that crazy? Uh, <laughs> For like three years and I just was like, nah, that's good. I'm good on that. <laughs> yeah, honestly though, like as a therapist, I know I've been in those situations where like your your aces as this happened. Yeah. But we're not gonna go there yet because until that person is really like ready and you have, as a therapist, exactly. it's hard. And you knew this as a doula too. Like you can't open a can of worms that someone's not necessarily ready to open you can encourage them to know that you're prepared to open it with them but you can't open it for them exactly because they'll resist it right or it could be even more traumatizing for them so it's like yeah so there I did a whole few years of therapy just didn't 
talk about it. And then I found a different therapist who specialized in sexual trauma. She's still my therapist. I still see her. That's today. awesome. I just saw her on Monday. But, um, yeah. and that kind of, I was like, no, I got to be a big girl. You know, I got to gotta sort this out. I got kids. I can't let it affect my kid's life for the rest of his life, you know? Definitely. Yeah. That's amazing that you faced it. And obviously you've been very successful. You even mentioned earlier, you've always been a high achiever and always been able to pursue great things. Um, and it didn't hold you back, which is also incredibly impressive that despite that, although I imagine part of being such a high achiever and going for all these things is keeping yourself busy and your mind occupied with all of yeah, that. Yeah. It's like avoidant, my avoidant personality. Yeah, like, <laughs> let me avoid everything by taking on as much on my plate as like, possible. Like, actually. Um. <laughs> I just send this to my therapist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're like, bitch. I give you permission to <laughs> enter my personal life right now with this. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it is a lot. And I do like, that is the thing. Like I have a literal, like I'm staring at like a bucket full of mail that I haven't opened that I need to. Yeah. Like, I wouldn't say that I'm the most organized and I wouldn't say that I'm the most efficient, right? Like I'm sure some of my employees are like super annoyed at me because I haven't done simple stuff that they've asked, you know, but um, yeah, I mean, everything is like, but I'm doing my best, you know, like I don't like, I literally do feel like I am trying my very best and that, and I go to bed and I'm okay with that. So yeah. I think that's so important. I used to be so hypercritical of myself and I would always like judge myself for what I didn't do or couldn't do or whatever. And then when I embodied that mentality of like doing the best you can do is all you can do. And if you know that that's what you've done, you're good. And you can say it's taken care of and you are happy with it. And you pushed your threshold a little bit more today. That's okay. But it's circumstantial, you know, like sometimes that threshold is a lot lower than it was yesterday. And it's all right to know that those things ebb and flow with us. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think that like what really triggered that like change in mindset for me was like, I was also very, 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 I still am like pretty critical of myself. It's something I work on, but um, was like, I think it was, like my son, when he was really little, he like said something, he did something and he said something. And it was like along the lines of like, it was just self-deprecating, you know? And I was like, oh my God, I can't have that. You know, like I can't have this like beautiful little child like saying horrible things to themselves because they hear me saying it, you know? So I think that was like a big, like, oh, hold up. You know, I don't want them. My daughters too. Like that's something I'm very like, Yeah. I'm just very committed to like setting them up to be like strong, successful, confident women. And like, they're not going to learn that if I don't, if I don't leave that, you know? Mm -hmm. Wow. It's that like generational responsibility in a sense. Yeah. Wow. I want to go through your competition journey now because you had a very successful start and you went pro at your first national show. Like that's impressive. I was curious if your goal was always to go pro or if this was kind of like next step is to go to a national show because I qualified or were you like, no, I want to go and go pro. No, I was pretty much like I'm doing this like after my first show. Um, Yeah, so I got into it, did my first show, got second in that one. Um, And then I think from, and I'm very, like, lucky with volleyball. So I played volleyball for so long that I have a strong, like, muscular base. So um, I started a little of a head, I think, you know. And then, um, yeah, I did my first show. At my second show, I won the overall. And then I had my, after that, in between my second and my third third show, I had like the very classic, like binging, like really bad um, experience where I couldn't stop eating. I was developing this horrible relationship with food, you know, like it was just not good. And then I did my third show and got second. Um, and that was like heartbreak. Yeah. <laughs> that was a hard second place. 
but I deserved it, you know? So it's like, well, what, what did you expect? You were not, you like, you were not on your diet at all. You were messing around. Um, and then I took a full year over a year off and then I did my fourth show and then nationals, but I coached myself. So I coached myself pretty much for my third, fourth and fifth show. Okay. You coached yourself for that? Yeah. Wow. So what was different about coaching? Wait, did you say you coached out for the whole thing or? Yeah. So, so I started, we had like my first coach who's a good friend of ours for my first and pretty much second show, but I started breaking away like towards the end of the second, like peak week, you know, of that second show. I kind of was like, I'm going to do something else. (laughs) And then, uh, and then, yeah. And then I was like, I just liked having, um, I feel like I just know my body very well, you know, so it just made sense to me. Yeah. And just experience, right? Like I just want to gain experience and, and, um, I think it's a very visual sport and I feel like I have a good eye for it, you know? So. Yeah. Okay. Well now I'm, I'm fascinated to know you're working with Adam Bonilla. Yeah. And he also has a great eye for this. Yeah. How have- way better than mine. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> He's okay, already so- me like so much stuff that I'm like, oh, I never would have thought of that. <laughs> Interest that's what I was wondering. I'm like, how is that combining forces? Like, are you guys being very collaborative or are you just like you take the reins? Yeah, I'm very much like I trust what you say, you do it. I will that's why I chose you because I trust you. I've listened to your podcast and I feel like our values in terms of business. That was like what really drew me to him is when mm. he talks about his business and his employees. And his values as like a business owner, that's mm-hmm. really what was like, okay, I'm going, I'm going to, I'm going to hire him, you know, cause that was something that I really related with. But um, no, for this, I'm very much like, you tell me what to do and I will just do it because like my eye, I would say is much more amateur level eye. Mm. Right. And then his is like Olympia level. And so yeah. it, it's really fun. I mean, it's very, uh, I lo- I'm excited and look the best I've ever looked. So. Yeah, you look incredible. It looks like you have transformed. Like you've put on so much more muscle. You look you look more like a well-rounded, developed athlete. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm I'm just I'm really excited. That's for the awesome. baby. I'm really nervous. So it's weird to be like, "Oh man, I'm going to be a, some of these girls I've been following for years, you know? Like yeah. they're real people. They're like real." <laughs> Are you committed to a show right now? Yeah, so right now we're shooting for Vancouver Pro in July. That's awesome. That'll be your second time on that stage, right? Uh, no, because it's Vancouver um, Open. That's in like Vancouver, Washington. And then this is Vancouver, Canada. Oh, okay. That's awesome. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so I know. I'm nervous. I'm excited. It'll be fun. I just like, you know, like the smell of Pro Tan and everyone's like running around in their little heels. I love so. it. Oh, it's so yeah. fun. I miss that. Um, well, okay. So now let's go back to when you were prepping yourself. You won your pro card. What was your feedback at that show? And how have you been working towards delivering on that for your pro debut? Um, my feedback was conditioning. I've never, and that's what I'm most excited for, is I've never come into a show where I've been like, yeah, I was really I was, Mm. my conditioning was really good. Even for when I won my pro card, I was really behind and I did zero carbs for three weeks, like no calories, lost nine pounds in three weeks and then went and got my card because I was like so behind. Um, But no, I'm really excited. So like, yeah, we'll just see how it goes. I don't I think I got distracted because I can't remember what you asked me your your feedback from your first session. oh so my feedback was conditioning so it yeah. was conditioning and um you know like very typical bikini fill, fuller glutes fuller um shoulders legs like I do need more like leg like actual leg development because like I'm just I get like more you know like I'm a typical girl I hold a lot of fat in my legs but like once you get all the fat off yeah. like they're actually not that developed so that's what I've been working on I think with Adam is just getting a little more muscle so I can get a little more definition in my legs um get my shoulders bigger lots 
What position did you play in volleyball? Libero. So I was a DS or libero. So I played back row. Okay. Defense. Defense, baby. Yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm pretty sure she's not like the tallest no. of the bunch. <laughs> no. It was back row. I served well, and played defense. Yeah, literally, like, okay, you guys need someone to come in here and get a good run of serves and points. Yeah. yeah. Put yeah me in. That was me. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I played volleyball too. That's what I was wondering. Yeah, I had a pretty good little hop serve. I still play every Thursday night with some of my girlfriends that really? I've known for 20 years. Yeah, one of them. Lisa, I've known her for 20 years. That's so 20, cool. 22 years. 22 years. Because, yeah. Holy yeah. moly. That's so yeah, awesome. Fun. Yeah, like my life is so full, you know, like I feel very happy. Like I just feel very happy good. every day because it's like, I just get to do everything I want and I have like, um, you know, like I just, every time I get to talk about that, I'm just like, yeah, man, that's so cool that I get to get to do that. So that is cool. I love that you make it a priority as well. Yeah. And that's like part of momming, like just circling back to motherhood, right? Like that was like the biggest thing for me was I think a lot of moms in view sacrifice as like, mm -hmm that is what makes you a good mom, right? If you're like sacrificing everything for your kids, mm -hmm. but like you can't fill a cup from an empty cup, you know? Yeah. So. Definitely. So I know I went a little bit sideways there with the volleyball discussion because I was curious because yeah, okay. like, like I've been getting feedback from judges for a long time that like, um, well, first it was grow everything, which made sense. Yeah. But then like, my legs were like too developed compared to my upper because of volleyball. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, gosh, dang. But now I've been working a lot of the upper and I just, I was curious about that for you because I know for me, like my quads are, or like my legs in general, just look a lot more mature yeah. than like my yeah. upper body. Well, I am, I am like lower body dominant. Yeah. Like that is, I do have um, a lot more like size of my glutes than my delts. So I, you know, I have to pose a little differently with my lats and, and try to get a little bigger, but, um, yeah, so I am, I do, I have like three upper days, but it just typical, I would say like, I didn't, I don't have any, I didn't get any feedback that would like take me out for a full season. You know, it's just like, get a little totally. bigger, come in a little more conditioned. Yeah. So you just mentioned that you've had to pose a little bit differently to bring that out. You also mentioned that you had prepped yourself because you wanted to gain, you know, that experience. Um, and now you're working with a coach for your pro prep. So there's a few things I want to touch on with that. So number one, um, what do you think are some of the maybe underrated or even overrated considerations for posing and stage presence in bikini? Um, underrated, I think, is the confidence piece like I, I think that that needs to be like really honed in mm. before when we get on stage you know and then overrated um I don't know I think some people get a little like I think it's I do like when you can sense there's like a bubbly style or like mm. a sexual style or like a mm -hmm. flirty style like sometimes I think people just go a little way too hard on like adding that personality in and it's like yeah. just come out and be confident and like add a little less <laughs> yeah yeah it's like sometimes I just think it's too much you know like less is yeah. more for posing in my opinion like less is more I actually agree with that so. I feel like your physique kind of can and does speak for itself like you're already up there in a bikini and heels mm -hmm. with your hair done your makeup done you don't have to go over the top when that's already showcased yeah, exactly. Like they're already all looking at you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Okay. So now my next question about this. So you had said that you did prep yourself um, to gain experience. How have your own experiences in the sport influenced your approach as a coach? Um, I think that... Well, my, my body is also like very different and responds very different to water. So like, mm. it's not very similar to other, to like my clients. Right. And actually like having clients, I can see like, oh man, my, something's wrong with my water. You know? 
so much. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but um, I think what has helped me the most with that is not being like not overreacting to like changes in weight or like lack of progress mm -hmm. or stalled, you know, because um, like I just find peace like, okay, and I know that we're going to be there. These are our tools. We're going to use them. Um, and that's that because when you coach yourself, it's like so stressful. It's like, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. like you almost, it's kind of takes the fun out because you're hyper analyzing every single thing, every piece of data that you have, you know, every picture you take of yourself. So like with clients, I think I'm able to be a little more relaxed and like cut that personal aspect off and be like, what are my tools? How do I use them? Um, how am I going to implement them to get them to this goal, which is like what I had done with myself, but just with a lot more like personal involvement. Definitely. Okay. Now that you're a pro, what is your goal? It, it, Cause it sounds like working with Adam, having the Olympia, it sounds like that's something you're working towards potentially or, or hope to. Yeah. Achieve. I mean, I do want to get an O qualification. Um, who knows when it'll happen right now. Like instead of thinking more on that, I'm thinking like kind of touching back. Like I've never been conditioned well. Like I've never, mm -hmm. I feel like I don't have stage shots that I'm like, dang, I look really good, so, you know? Yeah. So like my goal this season is like, I'm going to get some like really good stage shots. I, I love like, that. <laughs> you know how like some people get like, they look like shiny and like uh -huh. their muscles are so full. Yeah. Like I just don't have any stage shots that I like yet. So I'm like, okay, that's, that's my focus. I'm going to get some bomb stage shots. I hope that you can get a Gilco video too at some point. Oh yeah. His are so. They're so good. He, he did. I, I ordered one for North Americans and like, I look at it now and I'm like, Ooh, like I need to improve this. And then, but I, I was but it's really so, so cool. Yeah. Yeah. I was still really proud of it. And like, I love to watch it. And like, I actually liked it a lot because it was really crisp quality too. Yeah, exactly. Like stage shot. Cause it's so crisp. So yeah, I hope you could do that. And I think that's a cool way of looking at it. Like you're progressing in your own goals as well, but of course, the natural progression as a pro towards the Olympia qualification is in your, your map as well. Yeah. Cause that's like, I think realistically anyone who's taking it seriously in the pro league, like that's what they're all going for. So like I have to keep my expectations low because you know, some of these girls have been doing it for years and I'm like, all right, I feel, um, it's like, it's very motivating, but it is also like, I do feel like anxious, you know, like kind of stressed yeah. about it, but why? I'm going to have fun and I look the best I've ever looked. So definitely. So has this prep been different at all from your past prep? Um, yeah, there's just a lot of life stuff going on right now. So like, it's like the most kind of like stress I've had, like personal stress mm -hmm. that I've experienced. Um, but it's also like the most rewarding, right? Cause it's like, yeah. oh, I can have my whole world like turned upside down and I'm not mm -hmm. going to eat anything off plan, you know, like, mm -hmm. like that feels really cool to me that I've been able to like stick to my diet and like continue with my prep and be like, that's going to be my little, like, I shouldn't say redemption cause I didn't really do anything, but like, yeah, you know, like <laughs> that's like, that's my, I don't know that'll just make me feel really good at, you know when I step off the stage I'm like yeah I did that even though I like it was there were a lot of points where I could have been like I emotionally I can't deal with this prep you know but mm, absolutely I have been in a position where I've stood backstage and I've like teared up because I'm like I made it here and I didn't think I I didn't exactly. think I ever maybe would do this and I did. And like, that's a resilient, it's like a celebration of resilience in that moment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, I just want to do it and then be proud that I did it at the end. You know, like, that's my goal for that. So. And you're proving to yourself that you can even overcome things that in the past were difficult for you through a prep, like food relationship mm -hmm. or those types of things. Um, I'm fixating on data, which you're no longer doing, which is also awesome. I love that you can instill that in your clients too, but then also to do it up during the hardest time. That's a big yeah. deal. Yeah. So that's, um, yeah, that's, it, 
like this prep has been like very very difficult like I'm not gonna like sugarcoat it right it's been like a very hard prep for me but um but in a way like yeah it's but it's the most rewarding one you know so for sure we're just yeah I'm just enjoying the ride I love prepping so Mm, that's awesome well I know we've covered so many things is there anything that you were wishing I would ask you about that I didn't ask you um no I feel like that was a lot I know <laughs> I'm I so happy. talk too much I'm sorry I was no like, you don't really I literally like I was so happy I'm looking over here this is where I have notes and I highlighted everything I'm like yes we got to cover everything yeah. that I wanted oh, God. yeah so I feel like so gratified in this um and I've enjoyed our conversation so much and I always like oh, to God. I'm glad that makes me happy as well I love when I hear that it's mutual <laughs> Yeah, you're a great interviewer, honestly. Oh, very thank good. You. You're very good at that. Thank yeah. you. I appreciate that. I'm like 300. I think you're going to be like the 300 something episode. So if I wasn't, I probably shouldn't be doing it. <laughs> 307, baby. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, that one really sealed the deal. <laughs> so i, I like that. to end the episodes by asking your best advice so what would be your best advice for someone who has oh, wow. never competed before but wants to and then your best advice for someone on their road to pro just do it for the first one do it whatever like put your expectations aside just get on stage see how you like it and then go from there you know because a lot of people like hold yeah. that thought and then just never even get on stage um, and then for someone on their road to pro, I mean, I don't know, that's where I'm at. So I don't feel like I can give much advice on it. But like, oh, I'm like road to pro. Never mind. That's yes, I yes, yes. Um, road to pro. Um, disappointment comes when your actions don't align with your goals. Mm. So and I think that that can like dig people deep in prep, right? So like, if you want to go pro, then do what you got to do to go pro, you know, because I see a lot of people like, oh, I want to go pro, I want to go pro. And they're like, nothing wrong, they're dying. You know, mm-hmm. they're like, they don't really work out. Um, they're like cheating every week. And it's like, the, then how can you say that? You know, like, that's what you got to do to get there. So don't disappoint yourself. I love that. That goes back to your earlier point too. Like when you say you're going to do something and you ask yourself what it looks like to do that, you do that exactly yeah so if you want to be pro act like a pro and and get your shit together <laughs> <laughs> so how can everybody connect with you follow you and also work with you yeah so i have um my instagram is laura poster just my name um there's a link on there for coaching you can send me a dm um but yeah that's that's pretty much it Awesome. Okay. So we will put that in the show notes page. You guys, that's always on celestial.fit slash podcast. If you're listening today, Friday, it'll be at the top of the page. If you're listening in the future, just scroll down to the category section. It is alphabetized and you'll be able to find not just how to connect with us, but also all of the timestamps for this episode, a summary of all the topics that we covered and kind of like a back of the book summary of everything discussed so you can share it with your teammates yes i i will people use that it's so funny i never check how many people actually read the notes or anything or go to that page but i like to know that the resource is there so you guys if you're looking for that or you want to share this with your friends your family let them know what you enjoyed about the episode and why they should listen or what related most that doesn't just go a long way for the podcast, but it's really meaningful to athletes too. So tag us when you've listened or DM them and let them know what you thought because it's so meaningful. And uh, Laura, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. It was awesome. It was a pleasure for me and Chapo. Thanks for joining us. (laughs) You sleeping through the episode. He's looking alive now. <laughs> so I hope that you all have an amazing rest of your day, night, or morning, wherever in the world where you're listening to this episode. Just make it awesome. Oh.